A man retrieves the burned remains of someone who may be his brother. But how can he really be sure? Under the rubble of a burned down house, investigators find the shattered remnants of a body. Can they piece together what happened? A scientist must identify a woman from scraps of burned bones weighing less than three paper clips. Will he be up to the challenge? The fate of a murder investigation hangs in the balance. For centuries, killers have relied on fire to conceal their crimes. But today, science is catching up with them. The consuming flames are powerless to destroy the burning evidence. Fire. Medieval alchemists saw it as a tool of transformation. Used correctly, it could turn dull lead into gleaming gold. Fire does transform, but not in the way the alchemists hoped. It is a process called oxidation, the speedy marriage of convenience between oxygen and another substance. The union creates new compounds like carbon and water, while releasing enormous amounts of energy in the form of heat and light. All fires need an initiator, a spark to get them going. It's a little boost of energy that sets off the chain reaction. Then the fire burns until there's nothing left to burn. In Ohio, in 1994, Danny King started a fire, initiating a chain of events that transformed his entire world. King had a fiery relationship with his live-in girlfriend, Marilyn Garland. They had been together on and off for years and had a three-year-old child. But one March night, things spun horribly out of control. Danny King shot and killed Marilyn Garland. Then he tried to hide every trace of his crime. He set the body afire and kept it burning in a metal drum for two days. Occasionally, he'd stir the brittle bones with a stick, burning them until they would burn no more. He took what was left and smashed it into little pieces with a hammer. He gathered the remains and dumped them in the river. He may have thought that without a body, there could be no proof of murder. Then he ditched the drum behind a warehouse in town, a place where similar drums stood. Certain he had gotten away with his crime, Danny King waited six days before he called the police to report Garland as a missing person. Lieutenant Ray Todd worked on the case. Danny King reported Marilyn missing on the 26th, okay, and said that she'd been gone for a week. Well, it wasn't unusual for Marilyn to just take off for a, a few days at a time and go party. In his office, Lieutenant Todd reviewed King's missing persons report. Despite Garland's reputation, he had to take it seriously. He was joined on the case by Detective Gregory Mako. Mako found that Garland's family was taking the disappearance very seriously. We talked to other family members, getting conflicting stories, some saying There's, this is not her. This was her years ago when she was wild and free, but now she had a little boy. She wouldn't do this. She wouldn't leave the little boy behind. Something's wrong. They didn't believe that she just up and packed up and left. They actually believed that something had happened to her. 
Detective Mako began investigating more thoroughly. It was standard procedure to interview the person who filed the report. So they called in Danny King for questioning. He's a boyfriend, he's gonna be a suspect. And our thinking was, let's eliminate him immediately. That wasn't how it worked out. The interview took an unexpected turn. After that interview process, we asked him if he would be willing to take a, uh, a polygraph, a lie detector test. And he kind of hedged on it at first. So it just threw red flags. They arranged the test for the next day and dismissed King. King should have gone home, but he didn't. He went to a bar, concerned about the polygraph, and began drinking. He met a drinking buddy there and confided that he was worried about the test. The more he drank, the more he talked. Soon he confessed to killing Garland. His friend could tell King was serious. He felt he had no choice but to go to the police. He proceeded to tell me that he just left the bar where uh, him and Danny King were drinking for a couple of hours and that Danny King had confessed to him. Now the police had three facts to go on. A missing woman, a second-hand barroom confession, and a suspect who was nervous about a polygraph test. In terms of evidence, it was shaky at best. But Detective Mako and Lieutenant Todd felt it was enough to arrest King on suspicion of murder. King lived with a small child and a large dog, so the police felt uneasy about arresting him at his house. They decided to wait it out and apprehend him the next morning. They had no idea how violent he might be, but if he did commit this crime, they knew they were dealing with a dangerous man. Police called in the SWAT team for backup. Hey, he's coming down. There he is. As King went off to work, they forced his truck into a roadblock and made their move. After King was safely in custody, the police began to build their case. For that, they needed more evidence. They obtained a search warrant and inspected King's house, but they found nothing incriminating. They had divers search the river and the canal for remains. They came up dry. Without a body, a weapon, or any other evidence against him, Lieutenant Todd didn't have a case, and Danny King would go free. If King truly did try to destroy the evidence in a metal drum, they reasoned, the drum must be around somewhere. But all they had was a burned patch of grass. The police placed an ad in the paper to find the drum. Soon after the ad ran, police received a call from a local businessman. One of his employees noticed a suspicious-looking barrel behind their warehouse. Lieutenant Todd went out to inspect it. You could see some uh, debris inside the bottom. Reached in and uh, picked up what I believed to be was a bone fragment. And when I saw that, I just knew that this was the barrel that was used to burn the body of Todd shook the drum to remove more debris clinging to its interior. Out came nails, scraps of wire, some fabric, and a seed pod. There's one seed in this vial here, and this was found in the barrel, okay? We didn't know uh, where it may have come from. Later, we had it identified as a catalpa seed. It's kind of an unusual tree, and there's not that many in the area. And uh, there is a catalpa tree at 125 Canal Street, which is where the uh, murder took place and where Danny burned Marilyn's body in the barrel. But potentially, the most damning evidence pulled from the drum was also the smallest, tiny shards of bone. If Todd could prove they were the victims, he'd have a case. He sent them to the coroner for analysis. 
The coroner was fairly sure the bones were human. However, he wanted them looked at by uh, a, a top forensic anthropologist. Okay, he contacted Doug Owsley of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. Owsley has built an international okay. reputation okay. by identifying human remains. This wasn't the first time Owsley had worked with the Summit County Coroner's Office. A few years earlier, he helped them analyze the remains of Jeffrey Dahmer's first victim. We've had cases where they involve dismemberment, where they will dismember parts of the body and they'll put them in different locations. We've had cases where they've used acids and corrosives and disfigurement of the body to try and make it difficult to say who that person is. They all tell you something about the individual behind that process, and in the same sense, they all leave different kinds of evidence. In the case of Marilyn Garland, Owsley was literally scraping the bottom of the barrel. The evidence he had to work with consisted of 2.9 grams of bone fragments, about the weight of three paper clips. He also had three tiny shards of tooth enamel. All had been on fire for two days and were shrunken and distorted by the process. Could Owsley make sense of the paltry slivers? So it looks like. Start Forensic scientist Doug Owsley faced many challenges in his work on the Marilyn Garland murder. The first was confirming whether the bone fragments from the metal drum were human. In this instance, we got really lucky because one of the fragments that was preserved was his finger bone. And if you think about it, different animals out there have very distinctive foot mm -hmm. and hand bone structure. Think of a, a hoof, for instance, or, or what the, the foot of a dog looks like. It's very different than what we see in the human. And we've got not a complete bone, but actually just half of it, but it's enough of, us, uh, it's enough of the bone for us to actually be able to look at that and say, well, that's human morphology. Here, for instance, Owsley's next task was more daunting. And when you've got Could he tell if these were the remains of Marilyn Garland? Curve, With burning, it takes maybe more time to analyze it, and you really have to know exactly what you're looking for. But you still, with the fragments of the bone, male skeletons tend to be bigger, females tend to, on average, to be smaller. And so how it is burned and the size that is the result of that process is still going to tell you often something about sex, will still tell you something about age. And so it may make the identification much more difficult, more time consuming, maybe more tedious, but there's going to be a lot of evidence there. At the outset of the identification process, Owsley knew nothing about the victim's physical features. That's the way he prefers to work on a case. The ideal circumstance often is not to know a great deal about it. It's better to be a little bit in the dark on that sort of thing, or a lot in the dark about that. Let the bones talk to you in terms of what they have to say, say what the evidence is from those. From the remains, Owsley identified two rib fragments. The largest was a half inch long. He could tell one came from near the breastbone, perhaps the fourth or fifth rib. It provided the key to unlocking secrets about the body it came from. As we age, the rounded ends of our bones become more cup-shaped. The rib's cupped end suggested the person was between 24 and 40 years old. It was 3.4 millimeters thick by 13 millimeters wide. Owsley considered that small, even after assuming it shrunk up to 25% in the fire. You can never, on a piece of bone that size, bet everything. But on the other hand, you can turn around and say, in terms of probability, in terms of comparative data that we have, it's likely that this is a very small person. The size suggested the victim was either a female or a small male. If to determine at, which, instance, he compared the bone's the height and thickness against a standard a chart of rib measurements. Of rib In females, the fifth rib is going to have a, an average width of 4.65 millimeters. Males, fifth rib is going to be 6.78, so it's, it's much larger in terms of its thickness. So you work it through as best you can and try and characterize for the entire rib cage male and female values and what the difference is. With this bone, the answer was clear. By all standards, the person it came from was petite, very likely a female. The bones had told him all they could. 
it was time to take a look at the tooth fragments. Owsley had only three to work with. They were little more than chips of enamel. By examining the thickness of the enamel, Owsley could tell they were from adult teeth. Their shape suggested their approximate position in the victim's mouth. They had telltale grooves that suggested dental work. But it wasn't enough. He needed some high-tech help to expose traces of fillings. Then he could match them to Garland's dental records. Owsley sent the teeth to the Smithsonian's Conservation Analytical Laboratory. There, they underwent a process called Energy Dispersive Spectroscopy, or EDS. Most dental fillings are a combination of silver, tin, mercury, and copper. They melt in the heat of a fire, leaving behind invisible traces. The EDS brings them out. The tooth fragment is put into the chamber. Then the air is drawn out, creating a vacuum. An electron beam bombards the sample. It can be aimed very precisely. The EDS provides a 3D image, so the operator knows where to point the beam. The stream of energy excites electrons in the sample, causing some of them to fly off. Some elements give off more electrons, some produce fewer. By measuring the electrons spewing from the sample, the EDS determines what elements it's made from. The results come out as a graph of peaks and valleys. Each peak represents a different element. Its height corresponds to the amount of the element in the sample. The graph was printed out and given to Owsley to analyze. This is an area here on this count, fragment one, where we're scanning on the tooth surface. You can pick up the peak for calcium, peak for phosphorus, and those are normal tooth enamel. On that same fragment, if you go to a different location, here now we're starting to get a peak for tin, indicating the presence of tin on, the, on that tooth surface. The EDS showed that two of the fragments had traces of copper, and all three had traces of tin. Because the metals were found only on specific parts of the teeth, Owsley concluded that they were the remains of fillings, not contamination from the metal drum. He had already determined from their shape that he had fragments of premolars. Now he knew they all had fillings. With this information, he was ready to compare his findings against Marilyn Garland's dental records. So working with a dentist, I sat down, we went through and figured out which teeth she'd lost in life, which teeth had fillings, what types of fillings they were, and we would prepare a dental chart. And this is a basis for comparison with the dental fragments that we had. Most of Marilyn Garland's premolars had fillings. So the fact that all of the fragments also had fillings was consistent with her dental records. So I could never really say that it was absolutely this tooth or that tooth, but I could say that she in life had those teeth, and of those, seven of those eight teeth had fillings, and I've got three fragments of those teeth, and all of them have fillings. So it's, it's a consistency there. It's a, it's a point that, that seems to support this association. So it's just one bit of evidence those bits of evidence added up to create a portrait of a victim that was alarmingly similar to Marilyn Garland. Marilyn Garland, age 35, stood 5 feet 2 inches tall and weighed 115 pounds. Obviously they couldn't positively say that it was her, but he was able to say that it was a petite female, possibly white female, uh, between the ages of 25 and 35, I mean, it really narrowed it down, which was, you know, surprising to me just to find some remains, charred remains, to be able to look at them and uh, uh, obtain that much information from them. That was surprising. Awaiting trial, Danny King learned that he'd left enough evidence for scientists to come so close to identifying Marilyn Garland. Rattled by the news, he made one more mistake. Danny King confessed a second time, uh, this time to an inmate at Summit County Jail, and the inmate uh, ended up uh, telling us about it. And uh, Danny King even told him where 
he had disposed of the gun. King admitted stashing the gun in a storm sewer behind a restaurant. Detective Todd drove to the location and found it immediately. Police had all they needed. The confessions, the burned barrel, the weapon, and Doug Owsley, who turned a handful of splintered bones into rock-solid evidence. I've been involved in a number of cases where you're searching for a missing person. You know that person in your heart. You know that person's dead. And they may even have good, strong evidence as to who's behind this. But without that body being recovered and without that physical evidence, you still could go to trial, but it gets much more difficult. It gets, uh, it's, you know, you need a lot of good physical evidence. And a skeleton or a body is going to be a critical thing. Danny King was found guilty of murder. He was sentenced to 21 years to life. Generations of murderers have relied on fire to hide their crimes. But some little detail always lingers for those who know what to look for. In Tennessee, investigators depended on scorched bones to divine not only a dead man's identity, but also the strange circumstances of his death. On January 15, 1981, a house burned to the ground in Kingsport, Tennessee, before the fire department could save it. The owner, James Grizzle, hadn't been seen since the blaze. Nobody gave it a second thought, because Grizzle spent much of his time in Virginia. Then, Detective James Moffat of the Kingsport Police received a call from Grizzle's mother in Virginia. What's his name? She was concerned because she hadn't heard from her son in several days. Moffat smelled trouble. He knew that Grizzle had hired a live-in handyman named Stephen Leon Williams to help renovate the house. Williams was not a model citizen. I knew Stephen Leon Williams, and I was investigating him on some burglaries. And I knew that uh, Mr. Williams was living with Mr. Grizzle in Hawkins County. I talked to Mr. Grizzle probably about a week before his house burned about Leon. The fire department didn't look for a body once the blaze was out. But after hearing from Grizzle's mother, Moffat began to suspect something more than a house fire. If Grizzle was in the house when it burned, his remains would still be there. Moffat would need an expert to determine if Grizzle's death was an accident or murder. He called state forensic anthropologist William Bass. It's an interesting case because most houses that have burned down, the fire department's been there, lots of people have walked through the area. This was one of the few cases in which nobody had walked into this house at all. So you got there and the house had burned down, and there were no footprints in the house at all. And so we were the first ones in there. You can see over here, the undisturbed condition of the site assured Bass that any signs of foul play would still be there. Moffat pointed out the locations of the bedrooms, kitchen, and living room so Bass could get his bearings. As with any archaeological excavation, he and his team carefully sifted through the debris with trowels and brushes. They moved one brick at a time, searching for the all-important remains. A little over an hour after they began, Bass found some human lower leg bones on the concrete basement floor. Before long, scattered bones started coming out of the rubble, and with them, a horrible story began to emerge. The body had been lying on its back, but the legs were up over the body, as, as if you lay down and take your feet and pull them up to your head. However, there was no head. The victim was separated below the shoulders, and the upper and lower halves of the skeleton were 12 feet apart. That wasn't That's entirely unusual. A skeleton may become jumbled if the victim had fallen through the floor and landed in the basement. But Bass knew that wasn't the case here. Had the body fallen, he would have found debris between the skeleton and the concrete. Bass found no debris. In fact, the victim was fused to the floor. 
It's like taking a piece of meat and putting it in a, in a hot skillet. That meat will sear onto the hot surface. In this case, uh, the fats running out were so hot that they literally solidified the what clothing remained. So we had to scrape off the clothing and there was no debris between the floor and the bones. The condition of the clothing told Bass the victim was in the basement when the fire began. If the body didn't fall from a height, Bass knew of only one other way to explain how the bones became scattered, an explosion. Neighbors' reports confirmed Bass's conclusion. They heard a blast shortly before the fire. Judging from the way the upper torso was separated, Bass suspected the center of the explosion was on the victim's chest. It might have been some freak accident. But then Bass found another clue. The flattened remains of a spent bullet lay upon the basement floor, just below the victim's heart. Bass could tell from its mushroom shape that it had traveled through the victim and flattened against the concrete. At first glance, it looked like homicide. But homicide cases are won on hard facts, not speculation. To prove murder, he needed all the evidence he could muster. In his lab at the University of Tennessee, Bass has teased the truth from countless human remains. Here, he took a closer look at the bones pulled from Grizzle's house. He would try to determine what events caused the destruction of a home and the death of a person. With burned remains, it's not always easy. When a body burns, much of it is destroyed. The arms and legs separate. Fluid in the head turns to steam and bursts the skull. As bones burn, they retain their shape, but they shrink up to 33% depending on the temperature of the fire, how long they were exposed to it, and which bones they are. Fire turns them brittle. They shatter while they burn and can crumble if they're touched or moved afterward. Collecting a complete skeleton is nearly impossible. Because burning disfigures bones, it's a common way to hide the cause of death. Investigators must learn to distinguish the subtle differences between damage caused by fire and damage from a murder weapon. Bass demonstrates that even a bullet in the head can go undetected unless the forensic investigator knows how to find it. All of these pieces were all together in a jumble. We x-rayed this and there is little flakes of lead in the bone indicating, hey, this individual's been shot. Then we wanted, can we determine where this individual was shot. So we sat down and parted, started putting the skull together, all of these pieces, and sure enough, here comes your entry wound right there. Joanne Bennett, a student of Dr. Bass, is hoping to find a more efficient way to recognize injuries not caused by fire. In her research, she experiments with bone scraps from pigs. First, she damages them to simulate foul play then burns them to see how they change. We designed several uh, different traumatic events to address, uh, to address the trauma that anthropologists recognize. Bennett and other graduate students saw, strike, and stab a variety of pig bones. The bones are then photographed, x-rayed, and sketched to record every nuance of the damage. Once the bones have been catalogued, the students burn them. If they're lucky, they use a house schedule to be torched for fire training. The goal is to simulate as closely as possible a real-world situation. After the smoke clears, the students pick through the rubble to retrieve as many bone fragments as they can find. They take the bones back to the lab and examine them to see if they can detect the marks they made. 
The marks made by a scalpel or saw blade survived the fire with no problem. The fine striations of the saw can even be seen with the naked eye. The marks made by the hammer are less easy to discern. Bennett is just starting her research. As she and her colleagues experiment with a wider sample of bones, she feels confident they'll come up with some guidelines forensic investigators can use in the future. With the remains in his lab, Bass pieced together the sorry events that transpired in James Grizzle's house. The flattened bullet and scattered bones suggested murder. The color of the bones backed that up. As bones heat up, their color changes. Forensic investigators depend on that to estimate the fire's temperature. Especially hot flames suggest an accelerant like gasoline was used. And that means arson. At about 545 degrees Fahrenheit, bones turn reddish or grayish brown. Between 970 and 1200 degrees, they turn black. Over 1200 degrees, all the organic material burns out, leaving a white shell of calcium. The remains in Grizzle's house were white. They must have burned at about 2000 degrees, indicating the use of an accelerant. Bass concluded the fire was deliberately set. Now, Bass was sure he could prove homicide. The burned remains told him that the victim was shot to death, the body blown apart, and the house set on fire to hide the crime. But who was the victim? Though reasonably certain it was James Grizzle, Bass had to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Without naming the victim, Moffat couldn't catch his murderer. To identify the victim, Bass first examined seams in the skull, called sutures. They slowly close as we grow older and are gone by age 40. Inside the skull of the victim, the sutures had disappeared. On the outside, they were almost completely gone as well. Now this would indicate that he was not only 18, but was, you know, middle-aged. You get in at least 30s, so, so forth. Age can be determined another way, by looking at the joint surfaces of the bones. As people age, the body deposits more bone around the joints, causing a condition called arthritic lipping. It begins in the late 20s or early 30s and increases with age. The lipping was consistent with someone in his mid-30s. James Grizzle was 38 years old. Bass next examined the external occipital protuberance, the bulge on the back of the head, to determine the victim's sex. The structure is larger in males than in females. It left Bass with little room for doubt that the victim was male. This is one of the best ones I've ever seen. This is a classic textbook case of an external occipital protuberance which would indicate that this individual was, was a male. So by just this little piece you could get not only sex but age with, with that right there. Um, From the evidence, the right Bass piece. determined the victim was a white male in his mid-30s, a description consistent with James Grizzle, but not close enough to hold up in court. To be absolutely positive, Bass relied on Grizzle's dental records. You have this tooth with a filling that's attached to the tooth after the fire. So we asked the police if they could find from the family a dental record of him. We knew he'd been to the dentist because you could see there were fillings in here. Bass compared the structure of the tooth and the shape of the root. From Grizzle's dental records, he was able to make his final determination. This was the skeleton of James Grizzle. The teeth provided Bass with a quick and easy way to make a difficult identification. But it was important that he first tried to make the ID using the bones. Otherwise, he'd have no way of knowing if more than one victim was buried in the rubble. If the bones and teeth all suggest the same person, Bass can be confident only one victim was buried there. That person was James Grizzle. Based on this information, 
Detective Moffat had a case against Leon Williams. It was further bolstered by the discovery that Williams had stolen James Grizzle's truck and forged his checks. Faced with the evidence, Leon Williams confessed. In his confession, he confirmed Bass's careful reconstruction of the crime. He shot James Grizzle in the basement, poured gasoline throughout the house, strapped an explosive to the victim, and when it went off, it set the house on fire. For his crime, Leon Williams was sentenced to life. If you don't destroy the evidence, if you don't you know, bring in a bulldozer and clean it all off or something like that, the evidence is there. If you know what to look for, it takes you a while, but uh, we were able to reconstruct the events that occurred in this case exactly the way the individual who was charged and, and convicted said it happened. William Bass unmasked a killer who went to great lengths to disguise his crime. Elsewhere, a man went to greater lengths to bring the bones of his missing brother back from Guatemala. Guatemala, 1985. A country caught in a civil war between the government and communist guerrillas. In the outlying villages, the government appoints civil patrollers, an armed militia made up of civilians. Everyone must serve one day a week. The government provides guns, but no training. It instructs the militia to patrol for communist rebels, but nobody patrols the militia. For hungry young journalists, 1985 was an exciting and dangerous time to be in Guatemala. Freelance American journalist Nick Blake and photographer Griffith Davis underestimated that danger. In their pursuit of a story, they headed into a remote part of the country and vanished. Nick Blake's brother, Randy, did all he could to uncover what happened. My brother disappeared in March of 85. I'd been doing requests with the State Department and four or five other federal agencies uh, who would be in a position to know things, such as the CIA and the National Security Agency and others uh, for ever since, you know, probably 1987. Randy Blake found only dead ends. Then, a year and a half into his search, he heard an unconfirmed story from an American teacher in a village in Guatemala. We would go to little fiestas with him and so forth, and he got to know them, and they would talk about the gringos that got killed by the Civil Patrol. Piecing together the details, the teacher believed the Civil Patrol shot the journalists in 1985. A ravine became their makeshift grave. The Blake family kept pressure on the U.S. and Guatemalan governments to find Nick. To hide the crime, the civil patrol retrieved the skeletons and burned them in a raging bonfire. The flames split and shattered the bones beyond all recognition. Or at least that's what the patrollers thought. But the Blake family persisted. The patrollers were pressured into sending the remains to the United States. They arrived in 1990, but an analysis uncovered a deception. The crate did not contain human remains. Convinced they had exposed a cover-up, the Blakes and U.S. authorities demanded the truth. Felipe Alva, the regional commander of the Guatemalan Civil Patrol, refused to talk about the incident until the Blakes offered an incentive. And he was going to be offered a $10,000 reward. And so, but it was going to be paid to him in allotments as he performed along the job. Enticed by the offer, Alva agreed to send the real remains to the U.S. so long as the family promised not to prosecute. He came out with a partial unearthing of remains from the site. 
and he brought them back in two boxes, very curious things. They were essentially little caskets, mini caskets, square pine boxes that were velvet lined. And it was the strangest thing because they had dirt in them from the site with little bone chips salted throughout them and so forth, because that's essentially what was remained in my brother and his friend. The grim homecoming occurred without ceremony at a loading dock behind the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. The unmarked remains had traveled over 3,000 miles to get there. Navigating through a maze of deception and lies. But more work lay ahead before the Blakes could put their loved one to rest and find the closure they sought. This time, they had to be certain the bones in the crates were truly Nick's and Griffith's. For the delicate task of identifying the remains, they pinned their hopes on forensic anthropologist Doug Owsley. When the crates arrived, they were x-rayed to see if they required special handling to avoid damage. They contained no surprises. Mostly soil, ash, roots, and bits of bone. Then, Owsley and his team sorted the bones. It was immediately apparent the remains were human. They also found a duplication of parts and a color difference. Owsley was certain these were the remains of two people. Out of 150 pounds of dirt and debris, they recovered about two pounds of incinerated bone. The largest of the more than 1,600 fragments was just three inches long. But Owsley was fortunate. Some of the fragments came from the occipital protuberance at the back of the skull. The large size of the specimens indicated both were male. But they could have been almost any two men. Then he found a nickel-sized piece of bone that made all the difference. It was a fragment that fits in the forehead and forms a ridge or crest for the sinuses inside the skull. It's called the frontal crest. Now this is a really unusual configuration of the frontal crest here. Usually this is a, a solid, prominent ridge, but in a small percentage of the population you can get a double ridge morphology like that. So we had this piece, and based on that, I had a, a microfilm of an X-ray that was taken of Griffith Davis. Owsley compared the crest with an X-ray of Davis's head taken after a car accident. The unusual structure of the bone fragment from Guatemala matched the X-ray. But did that prove the fragment came from Davis's skull? Not unless Owsley could first prove that its structure was truly rare. To see how often the crest structure occurred in the general population, Owsley referred to a group of skeletons known as the Terry Collection. The more than 1,600 skeletons of the Terry Collection were donated for medical research from the 1920s to the 1940s. They represent a cross-section of the population. The medical history of each individual is part of the record. Owsley used the Terry Collection to see what percentage of the population shared Davis's frontal crest structure. If only a few people had that bone configuration, and if it was shared by the Guatemala sample and Davis, then Owsley could reasonably conclude the bones could belong to Davis. If you look at this cranial vault, for instance, one of the things that you've got is here's a cribriform plate, frame and cecum, and then you've got this standard type of frontal crest. And it's a very prominent ridge that occurs in 88% of white males. Now, in contrast, you see how you've got, again, the same structure, but now we've got a double ridge and a groove. This is the type that we see in, in, in Griffith Davis's cranium. This occurs 9% of the time. Davis and the remains from Guatemala shared the same rare anatomical feature. Owsley felt confident the skull fragments could belong to Davis. But were the remaining bones Nick Blake's? 
The limited sample enabled Owsley to perform only one more test, determining the relative age of the bodies. For this, he relied on the sutures in the skulls. In the specimen that Owsley thought to be Griffith Davis, the sutures showed advanced closure, suggesting a man in his 30s. The sutures on the other remains were still open, indicating a younger man. So that helped differentiate. The two, two males were differing in age by about 11 years. And this helped me determine that this is the older person. At the time of his death, Griffith Davis was 38. Nick Blake was 27. Owsley's calculation was right on the mark. To Randy Blake, Owsley's identification was encouraging, but naggingly inconclusive. If these bones were truly the remains of his brother, he needed to be absolutely sure. As long as a shadow of doubt persisted, the Blakes could not give up their search. But Owsley had reached his limit. He could go no further without more remains. We said to ourselves, you know, I mean, it's probably Nick, but you know, darn it, we want to get up to that site and we want to determine definitely that this is Nick and let's, 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 let's just make a trip down there. We've got an opportunity. Going to Guatemala was the only choice the Blakes had if they wanted to honor their brother. But Owsley had to accompany them. Only he could provide the assurance the Blakes had waited so long for. Together, they would retrace the final steps of Nicholas Blake and Griffith Davis. With forensic anthropologist Doug Owsley's help, Randy Blake felt he was close to finding his brother. He knew that the only way to claim Nick's remains was to retrieve them himself. Randy, his brother Sam, Owsley, and a colleague made the trip to Guatemala in June 1992. There, they met regional civil patrol commander Felipe Alva. He took them to the remote mountain location of the remains. But Owsley wasn't buying it. And I take my trowel and uh, do a little scraping. I cut down to about 15 centimeters, and I, I come up and say, this is the wrong site. I say, there's not enough ash. There's no bone fragments here. There's, there's uh, none of the red soil that I'm looking for. There, I just looked at this, all of this, two containers uh, a couple months before, and, and there's no, uh, no the, none of the roots that were found in any of that. Then, sheepishly, Alva's assistant reached under a log and removed a green plastic bag that contained a handful of human bone fragments and some soil. And in this eight ounces of soil, it's got the right color, it's got the charcoal, it's got root fragments. And I say, this is from the right site. And he says, I got it right here. The assistant told them these were the last of the remains. The Americans demanded to see where they came from. We went back to our little hotel in, in Nebab, and we, we basically grilled, I mean, grilled Felipe Alva for three hours that night with a Guatemalan colonel, US Embassy defense attache, US Army colonel couple of other people in the room and basically said him and said, Alva, you lied to us. Under duress, Felipe Alva agreed to take the team to a site he swore was the actual location of the remains. When they arrived two days later, Owsley looked it over with a skeptic's eye. We could see the indentation where the soil had been taken out. We worked it around the perimeters and we found a lot of things. One of the things we found lots of was metal. Well, here's part of an eyeglass frame part of the eyeglass piece and the frame, and it's a circular, circular type of pattern. And it's just one of the things that when we first picked it up, one of the brothers of this man said, that looks like his glasses. So we knew that we were in a, a very significant spot. Now certain they had the right spot, the team collected all they could and headed home. It was almost like tailor-made for Doug Owsley. I mean, it was like, it was so, it was so perfect because he, he, you know, we were so lucky to have him in that one day because clearly a deception was, was planned and was about was being executed, clearly. And, and, and he, he just totally blew it out of the water by, by being there and allowed us to have the ammunition to get this guy to come clean. Among the bones Doug Owsley carried back with him were fragments of a shattered jawbone. 
they still held some of the teeth and all the roots. They would enable him to make a direct comparison to Blake's dental records. From the dental records that we had of him in life, we knew that he had impacted third molars. And they had come in at an angle where the third molar had bumped into the second and had gotten locked up. And so what it had actually done is wore a contact or a wear facet into the side of the second molar. And it had a very distinctive root associated with it. From the shape of the teeth and roots, Owsley was able to positively identify Nick Blake. For the Blake family, it marked the end of a grueling emotional ordeal. Now they could grieve Nick's loss and give his remains a proper burial. That meant everything to repatriate his remains and bring them back and, and, and bury them in a, in, a, you know, in, a, in a cemetery and give them a grave marker, which we did. Not enough remains of Blake or Davis were recovered to confirm they were shot. For the Blakes and the Davises, that was no longer important. Bringing Nick and Griffith home was enough. From the ashes of murder rise lingering clues, transformed but never erased. As scientists learn to read their meaning, they can restore what the fire has taken. And by doing so, find a loved one or catch a killer. Investigators seek a serial bomber whose targets crisscross New York State. Four deadly explosions in 90 minutes leave only vague clues to the bomber's identity. Detectives in Florida rush to the scene of a massive explosion at a lavish estate. Somewhere in the twisted wreckage lie clues that will lead them to the killer. Bomb investigators must piece together the shattered remains of an intricate puzzle. Every long and grueling bombing investigation begins with a short fuse. Eleanor Fowler of West Valley, New York, had no idea the phone call she received a few days after Christmas in 1993 would be a prelude to death. A delivery service asked for directions to her house so they could deliver a package. Suspicious, Eleanor called the police. They told her anonymous packages aren't a crime, Hello? and there was nothing they could do. Eleanor accepted the box with reluctance. She cut into it and removed the crumpled newspaper. Inside, she found a toolbox. Whoever sent it didn't include a note. She flipped the latch and lifted the lid, triggering a fatal explosion. Eleanor Fowler was the first victim in what was to become a statewide serial bombing. Five more bombs, concealed inside identical toolboxes, were delivered throughout northern and western New York within 90 minutes. Four of the bombs exploded, killing five and injuring two. 
Investigators from three New York offices of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, along with their national response team, followed the trail of explosions to each bomb site. The ATF is the federal agency assigned to investigate bombings. Special Agent Scott Samus of the Rochester Bureau of the ATF was one of the first agents to respond. The investigation starts on December 28, 1993, when I receive a phone call from my supervisor, who tells me to respond to Buffalo. He's had several bombings, possibly several deaths. Please come out there and assist. I'm in Rochester. I'm an hour, an hour and a half away. Uh, he then calls me back a few minutes later and asks me to stay in Rochester because there's just been a detonation in Rochester with possibly some deaths there. The four simultaneous bombings would stretch the limits of the ATF and other law enforcement agencies. At each scene, investigators' first task was to find every piece of evidence, no matter how small, no matter how inconsequential it looked. It was too soon to tell what might point them to the person who sent the deadly packages. Much of the evidence consisted of small fragments coated with explosive residue. To determine what kind of explosive was used, the evidence at each scene was bagged and sent to forensic chemist Doug Claypeck at the ATF laboratories in Rockville, Maryland. Well, in this case, we had to make sure that everything not only was stored separately up in Rochester, but was shipped separately down here. Um, and different people were handling different uh, parts of evidence. Even though things were already in airtight containers, we wanted to make sure uh, that was the case. As the lab processed the evidence, investigators tried to trace the packages. The bomber used local delivery services and the U.S. mail, making the parcels difficult to trace. Unaware of their deadly cargo, the unsuspecting drivers made their rounds. The packages, weighing about 16 pounds, looked harmless enough. How could the delivery people know they were laden with death? Not all the bombs reached their targets. When one driver tried to deliver a package to corrections officer Scott Kemp at the New York State Penitentiary, he learned Kemp wasn't working. The penitentiary couldn't accept the package. Aggravated at the delay it would cause him to re-deliver it another time, he threw the box into the back of his van. Through sheer luck, the bomb didn't detonate. This bomb and another that malfunctioned were disarmed by the Erie County Sheriff's Bomb Squad. They provided investigators with an important break in the case. They now could look at how the bombs were built. Inside this device, after the, the is tripped by opening it up, this would trip the device, not doing the latch, but opening it up like this would trip the device, like that. That would cause uh, the detonator to explode inside here and hit this about four pounds of dynamite. Also included inside of this um, device was uh, about 11 and a half pounds of shrapnel. And these shrapnel pieces uh, were of 28 different varieties. Propelled by the dynamite, each piece of shrapnel travels 10 times faster than a bullet. Moving at 14 to 15,000 feet per second, the shards can tear through solid concrete. Explosives are grouped in two categories, high explosives and low explosives. High explosives like dynamite and C4 are the most powerful. They are used commercially for demolition and excavation and for military applications. Very stable to work with, high explosives require a great amount of force, a detonator, to set them off.
Low explosives include the flash powder used in firecrackers and smokeless powder used in shotgun shells. They're easier to ignite than high explosives and are the explosive of choice for amateur bombers. By looking at the degree of destruction at the New York bomb scenes, investigators knew immediately that it was caused by high explosives. James Crippen, a nine-year veteran with the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, trains law enforcement agencies to conduct bomb investigations at the scene and in the lab. He's seen his share of the havoc wrought by high explosives. Certainly a pound of C4 is going to do a whole lot more damage than a pound of black powder. You know, a, a pound of black powder, you know, is make, a, make a pretty good bomb, but, you know, a pound of C4 will, you know, can devastate a building. I mean, you're talking a difference in detonation velocity of anywhere from 1,200 to maybe 1,800 feet per second for black powder to in the neighborhood of 25,000 feet per second for C4. So there's a lot, lot more force involved, a lot more shattering force. But sometimes people can survive a bomb blast even from a high explosive. Roosevelt Town resident William Lazor was a target of the New York serial bomber, but his suspicion saved his life. When Lazor picked up his package from the post office, the clerk joked that it might be a bomb. Though the clerk was trying to be funny, Lazor was careful enough to open the toolbox with his rake. That added bit of distance and caution saved his life when the bomb exploded. Several hundred miles away in Cheektowaga, Robert Fowler was less fortunate. Eleanor Fowler's husband received his package at work. These pictures were taken from a surveillance camera that captures a still image every few seconds. They count down the final moments in the lives of Robert Fowler and his co-worker, John O'Donnell. Just before the explosion, another co-worker, Jeffrey Camp, offered to open the package with his pocket knife. The blast was so powerful, it threw Fowler some 15 feet down the hallway. Miraculously, Camp survived and can be seen fleeing the scene for help. Six bombs, four explosions. Four counties in New York State. Each unexploded bomb was nearly identical, packaged in a toolbox and mailed from Buffalo. The bombing shared another element. All the intended victims were related. All the family members are interviewed. There were other family members who were not targeted, uh, who were found and interviewed, um, and who, who survived. And everyone was asked, you know, who do you think might have done this? And everybody said, well, you know, Mike Stevens. Maybe he did it. 56-year-old Mike Stevens had a girlfriend named Brenda Shavir. Everyone targeted in the bombing was related to Brenda. The connection might have been a coincidence, except for one more revealing detail. Three months earlier, the Monroe County Sheriff's bomb squad told Samus that a restaurant manager near Rochester found more than 100 sticks of dynamite near a dumpster. The code numbers on the dynamite matched the dynamite in the unexploded bombs. Investigators traced the numbers to the Kentucky Powder Company. The firm, housed in a quarry, sold blasting supplies. Employees gave Samus a description of a man who had purchased 55 pounds of dynamite and 50 blasting caps four months earlier. Samus's investigation revealed this man to be Earl Figley, a close friend of Mike Stevens. Samus questioned Figley. Presented with all the evidence implicating him, Figley confessed that he and Stevens made the bombs and sent them to Brenda's family. Figley explained Stevens' motivation. Mike wanted to exact revenge on his girlfriend's family for not accepting him. The relationship between the two started becoming strained. and. 
Mike started tapping her phone calls. And just as in any relationship, your, your own family is going to support you in your relationship with another person. And that's what happened in this case. Uh, things weren't going well. Family members of Brenda would tell her, if it's not working out, why don't you get out of the relationship? Police had enough evidence to arrest both Earl Figley and Mike Stevens, but they still had to build a case that could not be beaten in court. For that, they needed hard evidence to convict Mike Stevens. In New York in 1994, detectives continued to follow every lead as they built their case against a serial bomber. While Mike Stevens and Earl Figley were in jail, the ATF National Response Team searched Figley's hotel room. They found boxes identical to the ones used to send the bombs. A tip led ATF agents and the Rochester Police Bomb Squad to a cache of evidence in a storage locker Stevens had rented several months earlier. Inside the locker, police uncovered dynamite and blasting caps. The explosives provided the ATF and other agencies with the ammunition they needed in their case against Stevens. But the incriminating evidence didn't stop with the explosives. They also recovered disguises Figley wore when he purchased equipment and mailed the bombs. A wig, beard, and theatrical makeup and a beard and a mustache. They also found the books Stevens and Figley studied to learn how to construct the deadly weapons. The fact that these books exist represents the risk we take living in a free society, according to bomb expert James Crippen. The information has always been around on how to build devices. Uh, that's one of the things that we live with in the United States because we have a, a very rigid uh, view of freedom of information, no matter uh, how much trouble it's going to cause us down the road. And, and I certainly agree with that point of view that, you know, you don't want to restrict information. You just hope that people will use it responsibly. Besides the explosives and books found in storage, investigators also found tools in Stephen's home. And like most everything else used in a crime, tools can be traced. At the ATF laboratory in Rockville, Maryland, forensic investigators carefully studied wire cutters they found in Stevens' home. Tool mark specialists had to match the wire cutters with the marks they made on the wires found in all the bombs. Tool mark examiner Elizabeth Gillis. When you have two tools that come off the production line one after the other, they're each going to have their own individuality, their own individual marks, so that when you do make a test cut with the tools, you can put them on the microscope and be able to differentiate between which tool made which mark. First, Gillis cuts a piece of wire using the cutter she wants to test. The wire is the same type found in the evidence. Investigators must make dozens of cuts with the tool in order to study the angle, contact area and other attributes of the cut. Only then can they match a wire with the tool that cut it. She places the test cut under a microscope, orienting it to the appropriate angle so that she can compare the test cut with the wire found in evidence. She then superimposes the two images to see if the two cut patterns match. In the case of Mike Stevens, investigators made a successful match. The wires used in all the bombs had been cut by the wire cutters found in the basement of Stevens' house. While the books, wires, and tools helped investigators tighten their grip on Mike Stevens, they still wanted one more piece of evidence. They needed to establish a connection between the explosives and the suspect. 
People think that when a bomb goes off and blows up, that everything goes away. Uh, there's nothing further from the truth. When you have an explosion, all the explosive material is converted into a gaseous state that actually is consumed in the explosion. Well, that will go out as a heated gas, and when it hits other objects, it will cool down and start coating those uh, objects, such as metal or clothing or wood or whatever. So not only will you have unreacted particles of explosives, but you'll have this uh, gaseous film that's developed on other objects that you can test and get the residues from. At the ATF lab in Rockville, Maryland, Doug Klapek analyzed residue from the bomb scene to determine the kind of explosive used. Once identified, Klapek tried to match it with evidence collected from Mike Stevens. The residue from explosives evaporates quickly, so samples of the debris were packed in airtight canisters. To test for explosive residue, Klapek had to capture it as it dissipated. He prepared a charcoal-filled pipette which he then inserted into the top of the canister. The apparatus was then attached to a vacuum. As the canister was gently heated, air was drawn out through the pipette. The charcoal inside the pipette grabbed the chemical components from the evidence. These chemicals were analyzed to see what explosive they came from. Beautiful. The test confirmed that dynamite was the explosive used in these bombs. Next, Claypeck had to prove that Stevens and Figley had recently handled dynamite. If they had, its residue would have remained on their clothes. I found off of Stevens' boots and his clothes ethylene glycol dinitrate. Um, which is only found in dynamite. There's no commercial use other than in dynamite for this material. Investigators had made their case. They had matched Stevens and Figley to explosives and the tools used to make the bombs. Any missing details were sewn together by Earl Figley himself. With this evidence, ATF agents determined that Mike Stevens constructed six bombs in the Rochester hotel room with the help of Earl Figley. In fact, to shift blame from himself, Stevens made sure Figley played a significant role in the murders. Well, Mike Stevens was using Earl to do all his dirty work for him. And he, he was successful, I guess, for a few hours anyway, but not for very long. Stephen's motive was vengeance. He was determined to make Brenda Shavir's family pay for rejecting him. To be certain the bombs were fatal, he loaded each with shrapnel. There is no doubt in my mind that these devices were designed to kill somebody upon opening. They were a strictly booby-trapped device addressed to a specific person. In order to make the bombs harder to trace, Stevens stuffed the packages with newspapers from Buffalo, so it would appear the packages were sent from there, not from his home in Rochester. In court, Figley implicated Mike Stevens, then pleaded guilty. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Convicted of the deaths of five people, Stevens was sentenced to four consecutive life terms. Most times, when a bomb detonates, it begins an agonizing catastrophe. But in a small town in Georgia, explosions are an everyday occurrence. Worldwide, the number of bombings is increasing every year. An alcohol, tobacco, and firearms study revealed that from 1990 to 1994, the number of reported bombings nearly doubled in the United States alone. Pete Maston, head of ATF training, has investigated explosions for more than 30 years. Well, the typical bomber is, is uh, perhaps the ultimate coward. Uh, 
the typical bomber doesn't face, uh, nor do they want to face their opponent. They would much prefer to, to uh, uh, use whatever subterfuge and cover they can. To make sure these criminals are brought to justice, the ATF brings young investigators and students to this testing ground in Brunswick, Georgia, to teach them how to catch a bomber. Here, the ATF trains evidence technicians, fire investigators, schematic artists, and explosives technicians. At the academy, each skill is refined by repetition. On this day, ATF bomb scene instructors will test their students' knowledge by detonating three car bombs, simulating real crime scenes. The men building and packaging these explosives are highly trained experts. Their job is as delicate as it is dangerous. One cannot underestimate the power of the explosive materials. That's why, in inexperienced hands, bomb-making information can be a recipe for disaster, as instructor Larry Casey explains. All that information uh, that's available doesn't have proper safety precautions in it, and the learning skills of sequential uh, assembly processes, things that are important to know for safety reasons, are totally missing there. So they're always at great risk to blow themselves up. And we oftentimes will get a call and you'll find uh, the tragic aftermath in a garage or someplace where the kids were doing experimentation and what you get are pieces of bodies and tools scattered around and death and destruction and that's the sad part of this. Instructors at the academy begin the training session by building pipe bombs. These bombs are not mock-ups, they are real. The explosive powder must be filled with great care. Just a few grains stuck in the pipe thread could trigger a blast. A small spark or even static electricity could ignite the powder. For the test, the bomb is placed so the end caps shoot into the engine compartment and the back seat, making the work of finding them more of a challenge for the students. So that, that, that big uh, high pressure end cap should go right into that radio area. So it's, it's yeah. fore and aft kind of at this angle. Yeah. Okay. When everyone has cleared the area, it's time for detonation. After the explosion, ATF investigators inspect the wreckage. Some of the lighter fragments were propelled hundreds of feet into the woods, creating a huge area to investigate. These fragments provide the students with valuable clues about the makeup of the bomb and where it was placed inside the car. In the field, nothing can be overlooked. Investigators have only one chance to gather evidence. Once the scene is released, uh, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible in some cases, to come back into that scene or to recreate that scene hours, days, or weeks later. So it's a one-shot opportunity for perfection. It quickly becomes evident how destructive these small pipe bombs can be. This explosion was so powerful that part of the cardboard carton pierced the car's steel door. It's difficult to tell. Smaller holes. Other fragments sliced through the roof as if it were foil. These holes are larger because the pieces through the fragment is Instructors prepare the next bomb by mixing several low explosives into one powerful cocktail. The 
work is nerve-wracking. The powder must be tamped into the pipe and the detonator delicately taped to the loaded bomb. In some cases, the seat cushions are wetted down to prevent fire from destroying evidence the students will need to work with. The final package is ready to detonate. After the explosions, the students divide into teams. The team leader assigns each person to a task. Charlie, Ray, Rick, Frank, Joe. And Colin's going to kind of be the, the overseer of that group. What you found, if you feel like you found something that's a really critical piece of evidence, it's going to give us, particularly the guys that are on the car, to give them an idea on what the device is to help them look more deeply into certain things. Let's bring that up. The students work together to investigate the bomb scene. In the field, ATF agents have to work quickly and under a great deal of pressure. Students are taught early on they will have to work with state and local authorities, laboratory technicians, and most importantly, each other to solve a crime. One team begins its work by forming a perimeter around the scene. Then they divide the area into quadrants before they begin their search for fragments. Hey, Jim. Just let him. Colin. Here's your. Uh, this looks like the end, piece of the end cap, right? The students walk along the tarmac advancing as a team so they don't miss any shard of evidence. Each piece is then identified with a chalk circle or a small orange cone and assigned a number. In an explosive scene like this, evidence numbers can reach into the thousands. One team member records the identification number and exact location of each piece of evidence. Distances between the fragments are measured to plot their location. Another team closely inspects the damage inside the car. Their job is to figure out which fragments are part of the car and which may be parts of the bomb. For many of the students, this is the first time they have seen a bomb's devastation up close. It won't be their last. And while the damage to the car looks complete, valuable evidence remains embedded in the wreckage. Hatchets, hammers, and crowbars are brought in to pull these clues from the vehicle. The car is literally dissected as students search for pieces of the bomb lodged in or behind the dashboard. They never know where they might find the most significant piece of evidence. The students then move the car and search underneath. Bombs explode in all directions and clues typically become embedded in the asphalt. Inspectors then sweep up what remains of the scene. The debris is then carefully sifted through a thin wire screen to separate any small clues that may have been overlooked. Yeah. 
instructors intensify the pressure and pump up the realism by adding a chaotic element to the bomb scene. They're called survivors. Role players portray panicked victims and family members whose loved ones have been killed or injured in the blast. The scenarios are built on actual occurrences. The students must learn to be firm but compassionate in the emotionally charged atmosphere. As the actors rush toward the bombed out car, they're stopped by students who must be able to comfort them and keep them clear of the investigation. Once the scene is cleared, it is photographed and videotaped. Fragments are then collected and sent to a lab. These thorough investigation methods must be learned if the students ever hope to catch a bomber. You've got to be able to prove uh, your investigation in a court of law. And most of the time, that takes forensic uh, evidence that puts the bomb in the hands of the bomber. In the classroom, they get an anatomy lesson, learning the vital parts of a bomb. Tape, pipe, detonator, and wires are all carefully examined as the students begin to piece together the evidence gathered outside at the bombing scene. The need for well-trained ATF investigators is crucial for crime solving. Usually, when a bomb goes off, the bomber is miles away. But in a case in Florida, he struck frighteningly close to home. On July 9, 1985, two deafening explosions, seconds apart, rocked a quiet suburban neighborhood in Naples, Florida. The Collier County Sheriff's deputies immediately arrived at the scene. But the explosion had already taken the lives of two people. Matron of the wealthy Benson and Hedges tobacco family, Margaret Benson, and her adopted son, Scott, were killed. Margaret's daughter, Carol Lynn, was critically injured. The sheriff's office knew this type of devastation was no accident. They called the ATF for help. Special Agent Ralph Ostrowski worked the investigation. In my 22 years with ATF, particularly my time in Cleveland uh, when I worked a lot of organized crime uh, bombings, uh, vehicle bombings. This was, without a doubt, the worst vehicle bombing I had ever seen. Ostrowski and his team immediately set out to discover what caused the destruction. Debris from the exploded Chevy Suburban was spread for yards around. Oftentimes, um, especially in a bombing of this magnitude, debris can be spread um, hundreds of feet well beyond what you think it would be. ATF agents worked with police to establish a procedure to conduct the evidence gathering. The agents had done this many times before, and they knew this case was going to take a lot of time to solve. So by the second or third day, um, needless to say, the scene got to be very, very tedious to work. Uh, the agents were uh, forced to wear masks because of, uh, because of the stench, and um, they did an excellent job in recovering as much of the evidence as they did recover. Every fragment was marked. Chalk outlined where pieces of debris landed after the explosion.
it didn't take long to discover the probable cause of the explosion. They found pieces of large metal pipes that weren't automobile parts. The ATF was confident the vehicle was destroyed by a powerful pipe bomb, but they now had to determine how it was constructed and who planted it. The vehicle was absolutely destroyed. Uh, this was a large vehicle, a 1978 a Chevy Suburban. The top of it was, was peeled back um, with two 27-pound pipe bombs in a contained vehicle. Um, the force of the explosion um, uh, did a great deal of damage. The six. As the evidence continued to accumulate, agents began questioning witnesses. Uh, like I said, I went ahead and the first the person they spoke with was Stephen Benson, the only family member to escape injury. His mother and his brother had been killed. His sister was fighting for her life in a hospital, yet police reported that Stephen Benson's demeanor was perfectly calm, even upbeat. This raised the suspicions of Collier County Captain Tom Storer. My suspicions were aroused immediately that, that something is not right in uh, what was going on. That it just wasn't consistent with a catastrophic event that had just occurred. Within 24 hours of the explosion, Stephen Benson stopped talking directly with police. All questions filtered through his attorney. Though suspicious about Stephen Benson, investigators had to be careful not to jump to conclusions. So far, they had no solid evidence for or against Benson's involvement. It was too early in the game to launch accusations, and they had no time to waste following a false trail. We follow the evidence wherever that evidence is going to take us. If we focus on one subject and use all of our resources on that one subject and we happen to be wrong, then we've wasted uh, very valuable uh, uh, time early on in the investigation when um, it's, it's probably one of the most critical periods. Back at the sheriff's office, investigators began to study all the evidence from the scene, including pieces of electronic circuitry and batteries, elements of a trigger device, They knew that whoever planted the bomb had some expertise in assembling electronics. Ralph Ostrowski and Jack Gant began to study a schematic artist's map of the explosion, giving them a clear look at the epicenter and direction of the blast. The purpose of these sketches that we're looking at here today is to assist the investigator when he testifies in court. He'll be asked by the defense where each piece of these articles were picked up and he must be able to testify that he picked these articles up in a location around the car. He must be able to provide testimony of what this article is. He must be able to tell the date and time he got it and identify it later that this is the item that he picked up the particular day of the crime. Without that testimony, this evidence cannot be used in court. The schematic shows where every speck of evidence was found after the blast. Their small size and great distance from the car are testament to the tremendous power of the explosion as it tore through the vehicle. Once the maps were drawn and the evidence was collected, the investigation moved north. Fragments gathered at the scene were taken to the ATF laboratory in Atlanta, Georgia. Here, investigators would try to make sense of the twisted wreckage of the vehicle. Forensic chemist Walter Mitchell, a 26-year veteran of the ATF, started with a visual inspection of the fragments. Through the microscope, Mitchell studied the small, wafer-like specks clinging to the sample. He tentatively identified the particles as smokeless powder. To confirm he was dealing with smokeless powder, Mitchell had to test it chemically using a process called thin-layer chromatography. First, he coated a sheet of glass with an absorbent layer. Then he placed dots of the smokeless powder and his unknown sample on it. 
The glass was dipped into a tank of solvent. As the solvent was drawn up the absorbent layer, it carried with it small quantities of the dissolved powders. If the powders were the same, they'd migrate the same distance up the glass, forming streaks of identical length and color. Mitchell removed and dried it. Then he put the glass under ultraviolet light to compare the colors of the streaks. In this case, the color of the smokeless powder and the unknown sample matched. A comparison of the lengths of the streaks matched too. The test confirmed Mitchell's suspicions. Smokeless powder was used to blow up the vehicle in Naples, Florida. But scientists in the laboratory could not find any way to link the bomber to the bomb fragments. That evidence would have to come from somewhere else. In Naples, Florida, forensic investigators began to track down the origin of the metal pipe they believed housed the bombs that killed the Bensons. Pipe manufacturers stamp a maker's mark on their products. Fortunately, enough of the logo survived the blast to be identified. Agents traced the pipes to the only company in town that sold that brand. A store employee told investigators that a few days earlier he had sold the pipes to a man wearing a baseball cap and sunglasses. The buyer said he worked for the Delray Construction Company. Investigators later found out that no such company existed. They took the invoices as evidence. The signatures were nothing more than a scribble, but the paper contained something more revealing. The invoices bore the impressions of a palm print. Could they be the link to the suspect, Stephen Benson? Authorities obtained Benson's own palm prints for comparison. They hoped to find enough points of identification between the two to make a match. In this case, these palm prints that did come up on these forms are in excellent condition, and the points of identification probably reached near 60 to 75 points of ID. There's no question in anybody's mind that these palm prints are those of Stephen Benson. We have an item we'd like to show you that we A background check on Stephen Benson uncovered his fascination with explosives. In a high school yearbook, a dedication he wrote to an old girlfriend read, I hope to see you this summer, then we can bomb around. We had developed information that he uh, started uh, experimenting with explosives uh, back many years ago in Pennsylvania. We had talked to witnesses that saw him with a firecracker, M80, M100 type of uh, devices, um, uh, using copper tubing, uh, using remote control. Uh, to set off uh, some of these uh, firecrackers. To understand Benson's possible motivation for murder, authorities looked to a financial auditor. The auditor determined that Benson, despite his access to a family fortune, was a terrible businessman. Police discovered that his financial failures were so far-ranging that Stephen started forging checks from his mother's accounts. When Margaret Benson discovered this, she threatened to write Stephen out of her will. Could it be Stephen Benson saw one clear way to get at those millions? Investigators believe Benson used his expertise in electronics to construct the two deadly bombs and the trigger device he used to set them off. On the morning of the bombing, Stephen told everyone he was going to pick up coffee and donuts. But police believe this is when he planted the bombs in the car. Once that was done, all he had to do was trigger the bombs and a family fortune would be his. Or at least, that's what he planned. After Stephen placed the bombs under the car, he drove back home. 
he was gone approximately 45 minutes. Carol Lynn, Margaret, Scott, and Stephen set out to drive to the Gulf Coast to survey property for a new house. Carol Lynn reported that Stephen calmly walked side by side with the group, giving no indication of the tragedy he knew he was about to ignite. But as they were all about to get into the car, Carol Lynn noticed something was wrong. Uh, Carol Lynn was able to tell us that uh, the morning they got into the vehicle to leave, that things didn't look right at that point. She noticed that Scott was the driver. That was very rare that Scott was ever the driver. She noticed that mother was in the front seat. Mother was seldom in the front seat, and that was her place because she got car sick a lot. According to his plan, Stephen made sure everyone got into the car. Just before they were about to leave, Stephen excused himself to pick up something he'd forgotten. He disappeared inside the house. The investigation into the bombings uncovered the evidence needed to arrest and convict Stephen Benson. He was sentenced to life in prison. Bombs are built from common materials by people with an uncommon thirst for vengeance. Easily concealed, utterly devastating, a bomb can detonate anytime, anywhere. It's this simple truth that makes bombing so challenging to investigators and so chilling for the rest of us. But investigators have the advantage. When a bomber does strike, he always leaves his weapon at the scene of the crime. And with it is the residue of his guilt. In 1963, detectives investigated the murder of a woman in California but it would take technology almost 30 years to catch up with the killer. A trash bag is the only clue detectives have to the identity of a serial killer. So far, their search has met only with failure. But a new fingerprint technology will give them one last chance to put the killer away. In a murder investigation in Vermont, police have their suspect. Now all they need is solid evidence to convict him. The case hinges on a bloody but distorted palm print on the murder weapon. In cases that look all but hopeless, science finds a solution in the telltale marks of the killer's death grip. In 1985, a serial killer was on the loose in San Diego, California. The killer targeted prostitutes and other women. He'd rape and murder them, then discard their bodies in trash dumpsters. To catch him, police needed to identify his fingerprints, which proved to be elusive. On the morning of May 9, 1986, police responded to a call from a woman who came upon a ghastly sight as she was taking out her garbage, the killer's latest victim. When they arrived, they saw a sight that had become all too familiar, a body in a dumpster. This time, the murderer had wrapped it in two garbage bags joined with masking tape. After disposing of the body in the dumpster, he covered it with a blanket. Police questioned neighbors to find out if they'd seen anyone suspicious. No one had seen anything out of the ordinary. 
homicide detectives came to the scene to investigate. An emergency unit arrived to retrieve the body. The victim was identified as Joanne Sweets, a prostitute. She had been raped and strangled to death, and several of her ribs were broken. That was the serial killer's calling card. Would the killer elude police again? It was going to be a tough case to crack. Since most of the victims were prostitutes, the murders weren't always reported, or the few eyewitnesses were unreliable. But this time, the detectives were able to lift a fingerprint from the dumpster. Detective Dan Hatfield was part of a task force formed to stop the horrid wave of killings before it went any further. Primarily, uh, the whole focus of the, uh, the task force was to look into uh, women, primarily prostitutes, that uh, had uh, been found murdered here in the city of San Diego and also in the county. There was approximately 35 to 40 unsolved cases. The Joanne Sweets case was the latest. With any luck, it would be the last. Detectives believe the killer lived or worked in the neighborhood. Two other prostitutes' bodies had also been discovered in dumpsters nearby. We had Tara Simpson that was found in, the, uh, in another dumpster that's adjacent to, uh, to the Joanne Sweets case. Uh, the dumpster was located at the T of the, uh, the alley. Um, the early morning hours, the uh, police were called here. Uh, they found the uh, garbage container fully engulfed. The fire department finds that there's a female in there and she is badly burned. A lot of the evidence was lost because of the, uh, the fact that she was badly burned. Several months after Tara Simpson's uh, body was found here, we go up several blocks up the same alleyway um, at another dumpster was uh, found the body of Trina Carpenter. Trina Carpenter uh, had also been manually strangled. Um, she was wrapped in a uh, green duffel bag at that time. Hatfield was sure the same man was behind the deaths of all the women. But the investigation turned up no suspects. A manual search of fingerprints in police files failed to match the print found on the dumpster where Sweet's body was found. Whoever left the print didn't have a criminal record. The case went unsolved. Three years later, fingerprint expert Diane Donnelly joined the task force to work on the Joanne Sweets case. I was brought in on this case in 1989 at the request of homicide, and this is one of the cases that they had asked to go back and re-examine some of the evidence to see if there was anything else we could do at this point. She learned that fingerprint experts had already tried using a chemical called gentian violet to lift prints from the masking tape that held the garbage bags around the body. The process can expose fingerprints left on sticky surfaces. When a finger touches the adhesive side of tape and is removed, skin cells remain behind. The gentian violet stains those cells, revealing the print. Experts repeated the process over and over, but couldn't raise a single print. Then, shortly after Donnelly joined the task force, she and San Diego detectives received a break. They decided to make another attempt to identify the print from the dumpster using a new computerized fingerprint matching system. Several suspects were considered and dismissed before a match was made. The prints belonged to a man named Brian Maurice Jones. At the time of the San Diego murders, he'd never been arrested. Since then, Jones had been convicted for rape, robbery, and kidnapping a prostitute. He became the prime suspect in the murder of Joanne Sweets. 
But detectives knew the print from the dumpster wasn't enough to make a case. Jones would have an alibi. His mother lived in a building adjacent to the alley where Sweet's body had been found. And of course you could logically assume that his defense would be that he had taken out his mother's trash. So we needed something more concrete, that proverbial nail in the coffin, to link him to this murder and maybe some of the other murders of the, of, of the women in San Diego. Even without a print, Dan Hatfield had a strong hunch that Jones had murdered Joanne Sweets and the others. According to Hatfield's scenario, Jones most likely cruised the boulevard looking for victims. He'd pick a prostitute and take her to his mother's apartment while she was at work. He'd act like a typical client, but the evening would culminate in murder. Afterward, he'd wrap the body up and take it out to the dumpster, like he was taking out the trash. Jones was still in prison for lesser crimes, but he'd be eligible for parole in 10 years. If Hatfield could link him to the Joanne Sweets murder, he'd make sure Jones would never get out. I believe when Mr. Jones dumped Joanne Sweets' body in the dumpster, he probably felt he could get away with it since he got away with the other two murders. In their effort to prove Jones's guilt, the detectives would pin their hopes on the latest method of fingerprint technology. Stalled for three years, the murder investigation of Joanne Sweets got a jump start in 1992. Detectives once again focused on the garbage bags the killer used to wrap his victim. Six years earlier, no prints were found on the bags. But Dan Hatfield and Diane Donnelly were sure the prints were there. At the time that I was investigating these cases, it was my feeling that there were in fact latent prints on the garbage bags. We were just not using the right technique. I checked around. I talked with the FBI. What they told me is that there was a technique that was being used in England and also in Canada with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, a technique called vacuum metal deposition. At which point I called Canada. I found out that they were in fact using this technique to lift latent prints from uh, plastics and that they were more than happy to do our case. Donnelly took the evidence to the laboratories of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Ottawa. She was hopeful, but the prints were six years old. Would they have degraded too much for the process to work? They were more than willing and happy to assist me in this matter, but they were not too optimistic about obtaining any identifiable latent prints. The process, known as vacuum metal deposition, was developed in the U.S., but most jurisdictions don't have the money to utilize it. It's used more widely in Europe and Canada. Its main application is on plastics. But for fingerprint expert Pat Laternus of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, it's a versatile process that works when all other techniques have failed. Uh, it's possible to get fingerprints on things like magazine paper, uh, paper towel, uh, tissue, very fine uh, uh, exhibits. Uh, it has a limited application in some of those things, but really, when there's no other way to do it, and it works. Uh, if we take uh, uh, the best exhibit, the uh, uh, solid plastic type of exhibits, it's a matter of keeping that clean and then placing it inside the work holder of, of the chamber. Handling the evidence carefully, Laternus places it in the chamber. A few milligrams of gold are deposited on a heating element. Once the chamber is sealed, pumps create a vacuum. Once it's within a vacuum, the gold source is heated, and that heat is melting the metal 
the metal would almost liquefy, boil, and then uh, you can compare it to steam where it, where it would go straight up and condense it on the surface that it hits. A thin, invisible layer coats the plastic surface of the garbage bag. If the bag contains no fingerprints, the layer of gold will be uniform. But if fingerprints are present, the gold will sink into them, leaving the oily ridges of the print uncoated. The process is then repeated with a few milligrams of zinc. Like the gold, the zinc vaporizes within the evidence chamber. It will recondense only onto other metals, so it will only cling to the previous layer of gold. But the zinc won't stick on the oily residue of the fingerprint where there's no gold. The result is a high contrast fingerprint. The bags were removed from the chamber and inspected. This moment would make or break the case against Jones. After six years in hiding, the prints on the bags finally became visible. And with them, a dead-end case cleared a major roadblock. We knew this exhibit was six years old. We knew it was involved in a homicide, which made it a high-profile case. And uh, it was quite exciting to see the latent when we pulled it out of the chamber. The latent prints found on the garbage bags matched the prints of Brian Maurice Jones. The vacuum metal deposition process enabled Hatfield and Donnelly to connect him to the murder. The nail in the casket were, in fact, the latent prints that were taken from the garbage bags and that came back matching Brian Jones without a doubt. Uh, there was no way for him to disprove the fact that these were somebody else's prints. Um, that was a nail in the coffin as far as I'm concerned. In 1996, the state of California tried Brian Maurice Jones for the murder of Joanne Sweets and several related crimes. He was convicted and sentenced to death. Advances in the science of fingerprint detection had solved a case that seemed all but hopeless. Uh, I feel very good about it, the fact that even though these victims were prostitutes, they were people also. And I think with his conviction, I believe that they had their day in court and justice was served. The vacuum deposition process raised Brian Jones's fingerprints and secured his conviction, but it was a computer that first singled him out. In another California case, detectives used computer technology to pursue a killer across three decades. On October 2nd, 1963, Thora Rose was spending a quiet evening alone in her apartment in Hollywood, California. She had rented the apartment just a month earlier after separating from her husband and was slowly adjusting to life on her own. Rose worked as a waitress and kept mainly to herself in her free time. The ground floor apartment was considered to be in a safe neighborhood even for a woman who lived alone. But that night, someone invaded that safety, and Thora Rose became his target. He waited in the darkness as she settled in for the evening. When her lights went out, he made his move. As Rose drifted off to sleep, he pried open a window over the kitchen sink and crawled into her apartment.
Once inside, he slipped through the kitchen and crept toward the bedroom. When he got there, he attacked. After a violent struggle, Thora Rose, age 43, was dead. When Rose failed to come to work the next day, her employer telephoned her, but got no response. Concerned, he called the police. When they arrived, they found Thora Rose's body in the bedroom. Police questioned neighbors, but no one had seen anyone enter or leave Rose's apartment. Nobody heard a thing. It was one of the worst crimes the quiet Hollywood neighborhood had ever experienced. Almost 35 years later, Los Angeles police detective Mike McDonough visits the scene of the crime. Hollywood back then was a, a completely different place as it is today. I mean, when you think Hollywood back in 63, it was still the, the movie industry, um, still a lot of single family uh, residences here, a couple of apartment buildings, um, completely different world. The crime rate was practically nothing to compare to what it is to today. Hollywood now, we're averaging anywhere from 50 to 60 homicides a year. Back in 1963, they had four. The murder caused a major stir. The homicide division of the Los Angeles Police Department gave the case top priority. At first, just two detectives were assigned to the case, but the number quickly rose to six. Eventually, 32 uniformed officers and two sergeants joined the investigation. They canvassed the neighborhood for a suspect. Inside the apartment, experts dusted for fingerprints. There was palm, palm prints and fingerprints inside the kitchen and throughout the house. Um, There's approximately 27 fingerprints that were lifted inside the residence leading from the front window here into the bedroom. The police officers working the neighborhood found nothing. It was up to the fingerprint experts alone to solve the case. With the long trail of fingerprints left behind, the detectives were certain they would catch the murderer. Their confidence was well-founded. For more than 100 years, fingerprinting has proven to be one of the most effective ways to pin criminals to crimes. The science goes back to 1880, when Scottish physician Henry Falls suggested that ridge patterns on the fingers and hands could be useful in identifying criminals. In 1901, Scotland Yard adopted the idea, and the rest of the world soon followed. Fingerprinting works for two reasons. First, no two people share print patterns. And second, a person's fingerprints remain unchanged throughout life. The skin of human fingers and hands have raised patterns called friction ridges, which help us grip objects more firmly. They're constantly coated with a film of perspiration from tiny pores. The curves, loops, and other characteristics of the ridges can occur in billions of combinations. At a crime scene, the perpetrator may leave noticeable prints if he touched blood, grease, or another dark substance. If he touched something soft, like putty, the fingerprints may be impressed on its surface but the majority of fingerprints are invisible, known as latent fingerprints. They're made of about 98% perspiration and 2% body oil. We leave them on virtually everything we touch. Like film in a camera, they must be developed to be seen. The fingerprint experts at Los Angeles Police Department's fingerprint lab have long relied on powders to make latent prints visible. It's been one of the most common and effective methods since fingerprinting began. 
When lightly applied with a camel hair brush, powder adheres to the moisture in the fingerprint, providing a finely detailed image. The detective then lifts the print using a strip of clear tape and places it on a card with his initials, the time, date, and location of the print. This detailed information is vital if the print will be used as evidence in court. After the fingerprint experts working on the Thora Rose case lifted the finger and palm prints from her Hollywood apartment, they had to prove they belonged to the perpetrator. There's always a possibility they could belong to someone else. Detectives obtained what are called elimination prints from everyone who had contact with Thora Rose. They were able to contact those people, the uh, restaurants, places she worked. They fingerprinted everyone that was there. They also went as far as local delivery boys, as far as serving, delivering chicken, mail people, um, newspaper people. Anyone that had any contact with this place, they checked out. After all other persons were eliminated, detectives drew the only possible conclusion. The prints belonged to the killer. Now they could be sent to the lab to be compared by fingerprint examiners to prints of criminals in their files. Whenever police make an arrest for even the smallest infraction, they require the arrested person to be fingerprinted. The prints are kept on file and in some cases sent to other police jurisdictions. If the suspect is ever involved in another crime, his prints will be available for comparison. The traditional way of recording fingerprints is the ink and roll method. Each finger is rolled on an ink pad, then impressed on a card with the arrested person's name and personal data. The document is then added to the fingerprint files. Recently, some jurisdictions have begun scanning fingerprints into a computer. The scanner creates a digital image of the prints so they can be added to the database. A beam of light replaces the ink pad. Either way, the matching process begins when the examiner compares prints from the crime scene with prints from police files. Comparing fingerprints is much the same today as in 1963. The examiner must look for matching points of identification. The friction ridges arrange themselves into arches, loops, and whorls. Sometimes they end abruptly. Sometimes they split in two. The examiner considers all these patterns when making an identification. If enough of them match, then he can be certain he's looking at the prints of the same person. In the Thora Rose case, Los Angeles detectives reviewed all the fingerprints in their files. When none matched, they sent a detective to the state capitol in Sacramento to expand the search statewide. He scoured every file, looking at a staggering 30,000 fingerprints. The labor took months, but still, nothing matched. So, I mean, it, it's a point that they, they put in an unbelievable man hours of time on this case. And um, even with all that they have done, which is probably thousands and thousands of percent more than what we could do today with our crimes, they still weren't able to come up with anything. Even though the killer had left behind many fingerprints, the detectives couldn't match them to anyone with a police record. The case was unsolved. The files were shelved, and the murderer of Thora Rose went free. Thirty years would pass before time and technology would flush him out. Three decades after the murder of Thora Rose, a new computerized system of fingerprint comparison went online. The Automated Fingerprint Identification System, or APHIS, promised to revolutionize the field of fingerprint identification. It matches prints in a fraction of the time it took using the old method. Fingerprint examiner Donald Keir 
was one of the first at the Los Angeles Police Department to put APHIS to use. This fingerprint system um, takes a time to get used to. It was new. It takes time to utilize it, and we had a lot of crimes to solve. Keir and his colleagues first used APHIS to match prints collected from current crimes against those in APHIS's files. Then they tried an experiment to see if the system could solve old cases by matching previously unmatched prints. They chose 50 old homicide cases to test. Could APHIS breathe new life into dead cases? To find out, Keir went to the archives in the basement of the police department. There, under the dust of 30 years or more, stood shelves brimming with old fingerprint files. They were gathered from all manner of crimes, some solved, some not. One of the files he pulled contained prints from the Thora Rose murder. It was the oldest case selected. The chance of finding a suspect after almost 30 years seemed remote. But with millions of prints added to police files since 1963, and the ability of the APHIS system to compare them at lightning speed, detectives had a glimmer of hope. But first, the prints from the Rose case had to be prepared. Before APHIS can recognize any fingerprint, an examiner must photograph it at five times its normal size. In contrast to prints taken from a suspect at the police station, the ridges and patterns of most prints from a crime scene are faint and indistinct. The examiner must carefully enhance the pattern on tracing paper. Otherwise, the computer scanner will be unable to read it. Any place where I'm looping it off is where a ridge in the fingerprint pattern ends. And we want to make sure those are really clear because that's what the computer uses for a search. They're called minutia or characteristics. I check it frequently to see if I'm missing anything, go back over what I've been doing here. Where the latent print is unreadable, the examiner must hazard a guess as to line and detail. The tracing is scanned into the computer. The examiner cleans up any indistinct lines on the screen and identifies notable characteristics of the latent print. The computer will use these as a frame of reference. APHIS then begins the matching process. The computer looks at several areas of the unknown print. It then compares these points against prints in its database. It ranks each print according to how closely it matches the unknown print. In another room, the massive APHIS mainframe searches through millions of digitized fingerprints looking for a match. In less than an hour, it completes a job that would ordinarily take months. Then, the system delivers the closest matches. But it's up to the examiner to make the final match by eye. The prints identified by APHIS are compared side by side yeah. with the suspect's print. There can be a lot of things that match, but if you're, there's something that you know is pretty obviously a real minutia point, like this one was a pretty, pretty big one right here, a little short, short line, and it looks like that might be it there, but over next to it was a place where another ridge ended. There's nothing like that over here, so I would probably disregard that one. The APHIS system has had remarkable results. During its first year of operation, San Francisco police were able to clear 816 unsolved cases, including 52 homicides. Los Angeles police hoped for similar success with their unsolved cases. They weren't disappointed. Soon after they entered the fingerprints from the Thora Rose case, APHIS made a hit. The computer produced three suspects, among them a man named Vernon Robinson. In 1963, Robinson hadn't been arrested, so his fingerprints weren't on file. But he'd been arrested a number of times since then, so his prints were part of police records. 
detectives using APHIS fingered him as a suspect. Detective Mike McDonough headed the new investigation. Uh, my main concern was to see if Mr. Robinson should have been there or not. I wanted to make sure that he wasn't uh, one of the detectives or a police officer at the scene. He wasn't a paramedic or that he wasn't for some reason a friend of Miss Robinson's that fingerprints just happened to be there. When all other possibilities were eliminated, McDonough concluded that Robinson was the likely killer of Thora Rose. With that, our fingerprint people obtained the additional fingerprints, started hand searching them, physically checking the fingerprints from the crime scene against Mr. Robinson's prints, and everyone is coming right back to Mr. Robinson. I mean, at this point, there was no doubt about it. Los Angeles police tracked Robinson to Minneapolis, Minnesota, where he was now a family man with a management job in a maintenance company. He denied committing the crime, insisting that at the time of the murder, he was in San Diego at the naval base where he was stationed. But naval records indicated Robinson had completed his training by the date of the murder. His alibi was without support. Well, what swayed the jury was, I mean, the fingerprints are there. You cannot deny that. I mean, we're not talking one or two fingerprints. We're talking 20-some fingerprints. We're talking them at the point of entry through the entire house and right up to where the victim was discovered. After killing Thora Rose, Vernon Robinson managed to evade capture for almost 30 years. His life had changed, but his fingerprints remained the same. After they were matched with those from the crime scene, Robinson was convicted of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. APHIS, a phenomenal breakthrough in criminal identification, had finally obtained justice for Thora Rose. Though APHIS has dramatically improved the chances of matching fingerprints to criminals, it's useless without clear prints to work from. But crime scenes are often messy and criminals don't always leave their prints in convenient spots. In a case in Vermont, a murder investigation hinged on two fragile and ill-placed prints, and one investigator's attempt to read them. On Memorial Day, 1992, Glenn Michelson had a party. He and his friends were putting the cold Vermont winter behind them and kicking off the beginning of summer. But the celebration was nearly ruined by an uninvited guest. As the party was winding down, he tried to make off in Michelson's car with one of the kegs of beer. But three of Michelson's buddies caught him in the act. They chased him off the property and retrieved the keg. With the commotion over and the keg emptied, the three men decided to continue celebrating at a nearby tavern. Michelson stayed home. The group returned to the house 45 minutes later, still in high spirits. At first, they didn't notice their host was nowhere in sight. When they called out to him, he didn't answer. They assumed he went to bed. It wasn't until one of the men noticed something peculiar in another room that the horrible truth revealed itself. A ski pole that appeared to be sticking out of the floor was actually embedded in Michelson's skull. They called the Vermont State Police, who rushed to the scene. Michelson's friends couldn't believe the friend they'd laughed with a few hours ago now lay dead. While the police made their report, detectives scoured the house for clues. Their inspection of the brutal crime scene revealed a bloody knife in the kitchen sink. It looked like the victim had been stabbed several times before the ski pole was repeatedly jabbed into his skull. 
According to Sergeant Miles Heffernan, the victim didn't die easily. He was uh, obviously involved in a struggle, uh, had a, a lot of blood on his clothes. There was a lot of blood on the walls in the hallway. When questioned, the three men who found the body told the detectives about the person who tried to steal Michelson's car and the beer keg. His name was Robert Plant. He'd tagged along with one of the invited guests and grew surly as the evening progressed. The men recalled he wore white shoes with pink laces, the same shoes that were found near the barefoot corpse. The cowboy boots that Michelson had worn were missing. As police continued to investigate, a call came through about a car that had run off the road less than a mile away. A neighbor named Robert Salzman made the report. Mr. Salzman uh, was in the living room with his wife and child and, and heard the car go off the road. He came out and um, observed Robert Plant uh, walking from the vehicle to the uh, front porch of Mr. Salzman's residence. He had a discussion with uh, Robert Plant. Uh, initially, uh, Plant seemed pleasant. He asked if uh, he could get a wrecker, um, and uh, Mr. Salzman was agreeable. But then, Plant became aggressive and broke a window. Salzman threw him off his property and called the police. They arrived within minutes and found the car on the side of the road. It matched the description of Glenn Michelson's vehicle, but Plant was nowhere in sight. Apparently, he fled on foot. Police searched the woods and found him in a short time, passed out under a tree. On his feet were Michelson's cowboy boots. He was taken to the station for questioning and booked for murder. On the surface, it seemed Heffernan had an open and shut case against him. But Plant denied the crime, and the police had no eyewitnesses. Theoretically, Plant could claim he had stolen Michelson's property after someone else committed the murder. The detectives would try to bolster their circumstantial case with forensic evidence. Plant's fingerprints. They knew prints lifted from walls, sinks, and drawers had little value since Plant had been a guest at Michelson's party. But they found bloody prints on the grip of the ski pole and on a door frame near the body. If these prints could be identified as Robert Plant's, police would clinch their case. To help him make the identification, Heffernan called on fingerprint expert John Creighton of the Vermont Department of Public Safety's forensic lab. Because the prints were etched in the victim's dried blood, they were extremely incriminating and extremely fragile. Traditional methods of dusting with powder would not be effective. Fortunately, Creighton has a well-stocked arsenal with the means to recover difficult prints. How a print is raised depends on the kind of surface it's on. Uh, basically, there's two different types of evidence that come into the lab for fingerprinting. There's porous and non-porous evidence. Uh, the porous evidence is papers and cardboards and things of that nature, and the non-porous evidence is wood, uh, plastics, metal, glass, things of that nature. Uh, so depending on what type of evidence it is will dictate what type of examination you do. Paper and other porous surfaces leave no moisture for powders to cling to. One classic method for raising prints from these surfaces is iodine fuming. Iodine crystals are placed inside a glass tube. The tube is then packed with fiberglass and copper sulfate. Breath passing through the crystals heats them, creating fumes. When the fumes reach the fingerprints, the iodine reacts with fatty oils, making them visible. 
A drawback of this method is that the prints will disappear in about 20 minutes when the iodine evaporates. They must be photographed after fuming, so police will have a record of them. Another way to find fingerprints on paper is to spray the surface with a chemical called ninhydrin. Uh, ninhydrin is a spray or a compound that reacts to amino acids that are present in eccrine and sebaceous sweat deposited latent prints. The ninhydrin is sprayed onto porous material and is then catalyzed or the reaction is catalyzed by applying heat and moisture, uh, generally by means of an iron. Uh, this develops the prints much more quickly. Uh, otherwise, you'd have to set them in the dark and wait uh, anywhere from 24 to possibly 72 hours for any latent impressions to develop that way. Because the amino acids in fingerprints take a long time to disappear, ninhydrin has been used to develop latent prints as old as 15 years. Superglue has also become a staple of fingerprint examiners. Technically called cyanoacrylate ester, it's used on non-porous surfaces, like plastic, where fragile prints could be easily brushed away when powders are applied. Superglue is often used for developing prints inside a car. The glue is poured into a small container and heated. The car is closed up tightly. As the glue is heated, its fumes adhere to the moisture in latent fingerprints and fixes them in place. The examiner can then use traditional powders without the danger of destroying the print. The Glenn Michelson case posed a different set of problems. The bloody thumbprint on the doorframe near the victim's body was barely visible and too delicate to lift. Creighton asked detectives to remove the section of doorframe bearing the print and send it to him so he could examine it in a more controlled environment. Creighton's job was to make the print on the doorframe distinct without ruining it. He could then compare it with Robert Plant's. First, he took photographs so he would have a record of the evidence before the procedure. Items of evidence are photographed uh, before any physical or chemical development uh, takes place in order to recover and preserve any existing latent detail that is present on the item. Uh, afterwards, uh, then we can do the various processes that are applied to developing the latent impression on that item. Creighton sprayed the doorframe with a stain called amido black. The chemical reacts with blood, darkening the print and making it easier to identify. The amido black is a protein stain. It stains the protein that is within the blood itself. So when the ridges or the outline of the impression on the finger is deposited in the blood, the amido black is going to make that impression darker. Uh, it allows it to have more contrast uh, with the background. Bloody fingerprints are very fragile in most cases, so they can't be lifted with tape without destroying them, even after they're developed with amido. Instead, Creighton photographed the enhanced print. When he compared it to plants, it matched. But Plant could have touched the blood-stained doorframe after someone else committed the crime. And the evidence against Plant must convince a jury of his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The irrefutable evidence in the murder of Glenn Michelson had yet to be processed. Glenn Michelson had been the victim of a callous murder, a ski pole driven through his skull. Robert Plant was the prime suspect, but could detectives tie him to the crime? The answer rested on a bloody palm print left on the grip of the weapon. To identify the print, John Creighton needed to photograph it. First, he'd have to make it more visible. 
That was easier said than done. Uh, the big dilemma was it was a black ski pole grip and it was a dark reddish brown blood impression that was deposited on that. Now what I had to do was I had to improve the contrast either by lightening the background of the black ski pole grip or by um, lightening the blood impression itself. Creighton lit the print with a poly light, a lamp that can project a wide spectrum of wavelengths. The light produced enough contrast to photograph the print. But Creighton faced a second problem. The curvature of the grip prevented the camera lens from keeping the entire print in focus. I had to keep rotating the ski pole grip in order to come up with enough characteristics within the pattern area or within the latent impression that would give me enough information to make an identification. By manipulating the grip, Creighton was able to get a clear photograph of the print. After it was processed, he compared the print to plants. It matched. Creighton had placed the murder weapon firmly in Plant's hand. The events of Glenn Michelson's final hours now made sense. Detectives believed that after being kicked off Michelson's property, Plant hid in the darkness and waited for an opportunity to sneak back into the house. Once the guests had left, he saw his chance and made his move. He slipped into the kitchen and rummaged around until he found a knife. As he stepped into the hallway, Michelson spotted him. The two men struggled, but Plant had the fatal advantage. He stabbed Michelson repeatedly until he brought the victim down. He removed Michelson's boots and put them on his own feet. Then he realized his victim wasn't dead. So he found a ski pole in another room and returned to finish him off. As he thrust the pole, he put his hand on the doorframe for support. After the final blow, he left the house, stealing Michelson's car for his getaway. But he only made it about a mile before he ran off the road. The bloody prints that Creighton analyzed gave Detective Miles Heffernan the evidence he needed to convict Robert Plant. It was very compelling, uh, very compelling for a jury when they Hard to explain or, or explain away. You've got your thumbprint uh, in the victim's blood on the door molding, and you've got the handprint on the murder weapon. Uh, it tells a story right there. For the murder of Glenn Michelson, Robert Plant received a sentence of 50 years to life. For more than a century, fingerprints have proven themselves a reliable and irrefutable way to link criminals to their crimes. In the next century, their role will increase as scientists improve ways to recover them. More and more, killers will be delivered into the arms of justice by their own hands.